Section 21 of Astounding Stories 15, March 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Douglas W. Taylor, Port Townsend, Washington, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Papa Doug actor. Astounding Stories 15, March 1931, by various Phalanxes of Atlans, by F. V. W. Mason. Chapter 8. As the door clanged shut, drowning out the Allosauri's furious screams, both aviators, shaken to the depths of their beings, could do nothing but stare about them in surprise. Completely surrounding and protecting the exit stood a double rank of hoplites in bronze armor. Like unreal automata, they remained utterly motionless, fixed in the postures of an ancient Macedonian phalanx, their broad backs gleaming dully in the light of the neon flares. As in a dream, Nelson recognized on top of each spearsman's cask the graceful Atlantean military crest, a metal dolphin from the back of which sprouted a series of bright blue feathers arranged like a dorsal fin. "'Thank Poseidon ye still live!' cried Hero Giles, gripping their hands eagerly. "'I had fear for ye, O oh my friends!' Nelson grinned. "'You cut the rescue act pretty fine, but of course we're damned grateful.' "'And now,' eagerly seizing the hero's splendidly muscled arm. In God's name, tell us what's happened, why we were arrested and nearly made into Allosaurus fodder. Hero Giles turned from snapping an order to a subaltern who was peering down a great shadowy hallway with a distinctly uneasy manner. Much he said, scarcely had ye two departed from Heliopolis than the priests, mad with rage over Altara's continued captivity, dared to seize the person of his splendor and proclaim a regency. Heracles, the archpriest, is... From far down the gloomy vaulted corridor came a faint sound, rather like the distant cheering of a crowd, the hoplites, standing about, turned their helmeted heads and stared uneasily, their brazen armor glowing dully with each movement. "'I'll tell ye more later, but now,' Hero Giles' voice took on a ringing quality like the clash of steel, "'there is work to be done. To rescue ye, O Hero Nelson, I slew the guards at the lower gate, for this prison lies in the hands of a caitiff rogue, Hero Edmund.' one who clings to the priestly party. We had best be off, lest we be trapped and slaughtered like rats in a pit. Very distinctly to the ears of the aviator now came the dull clash of equipment and the tread of feet. Forward! We must hasten to reach the podokos waiting below, cried Hero Giles, settling his ponderous helmet more squarely on his leonine head. At once the escort of fifteen-odd hoplites commenced to move down the corridor to the left, their hands tightly gripping the butts of their retortii pistols. At their head ran Hero Giles and, by his side, Alden and Victor Nelson, who gripped his forty-five, vowing never again to return to that ghastly cell. A long ringing cry from the rear brought home the dread realization that the enemy had appeared. Looking back, Nelson could see the far end of the great corridor filled with menacing figures. Then his heart leapt like a deer in a thicket, for from ahead sounded the clash of weapons. The rescue party's retreat was cut off. Hero Giles acted with the speed of a veteran accustomed to emergencies. Forward, he roared, making the bare walls reverberate and rumble with his voice. Halar Van! Ula Stor, make ready for your retortii. As by magic, there appeared before the retreating force a double rank of blue-crested hoplites who debouched from a side passage into the hall and clawed desperately for fungus bombs and retortii. Evidently, 
They had not expected to come upon the invaders so abruptly. Store! Like a brazen trumpet's call, the voice of Hero Giles rang out the order to fire, which was instantly drowned out in the furious hissing of the retortii of his followers. Ever watchful, Nelson fired at a gigantic officer who, avoiding the first steam jets, flung back his arms to hurl one of the deadly fungus bombs among the rescuers. Shattering the bronze helmet, the American's bullet struck the Atlantean squarely between the eyes. But nevertheless, the stricken officer's grenade rolled forward and burst among the hindermost of Hero Giles' followers. Instantly, the deadly green mold flung itself upon the nearest toplights, and in a moment they crashed to the smooth granite floor, the yellowish growths already sprouting from nose, mouth, and ears. In the corridor reigned chaos, for Hero Giles' followers were now turning the full fury of their retortii upon the rank of men barring further flight. With dreadful ease, the scalding steam struck dead the opposing warriors, stripping the flesh from their bones as easily as a boy peels a banana. Amid the swirling white clouds, Nelson had ghastly visions of yellow skulls, of steaming accoutrement, of limp heaps of disintegrating bodies. Then silence fell, and before he quite realized it, he, together with Alden, and three hoplites who had survived the disastrous fungus grenade were bounding along after Hero Giles' glittering figure as he led the way down one passage after another. Louder than ever rang the fierce cry from the rear. Behind him, Nelson could see dozens upon dozens of yelling pursuers and knew that if he were to live, he must run as never before. Into a succession of spacious rooms dashed the fugitives, on through deserted armories where hundreds of bronze helmets dangled in orderly rows and across silent barrack halls. Closer and closer sounded the pursuing feet, spurring the runners to an even more headlong gait. All at once a door loomed to the right. Into this darted Hero Giles, and after him pounded the two Americans and three hoplites. In an instant, the six men set their shoulder to the ponderous bronze door and swung it to, just as the hiss of a retortii on the other side rose above the mad, blood-hungry clamor of the momentarily baffled rebels. Gasping and sweat-bathed, the fugitives paused only an instant. "'We've gained a short passage,' gasped the Atlantean, wrenching off his helmet and breastplate. The veins stood out in great blue cords on his forehead, for the weight of the armor could not have been inconsiderable. Below wait our podokos. Nelson stripped off his leather coat, following the example of the hoplites, who swiftly divested themselves of such cumbersome equipment as could readily be removed. Then, while the shouts of the thwarted pursuers swelled like a demonic chorus, and while feathers of steam crept under the great door, Hero Giles spun about and, with his short yellow hair gleaming bright, led on down another series of passages. All at once, the fugitives, now reduced by exhaustion to five, found themselves on a balcony overlooking the great valley of Atlans. Before them opened an enormous staircase, and down this they dashed at top speed, infinitely relieved to be once more in the open air. Running like hunted stags, the fugitives had descended but a third of the great staircase when, from behind, came a sudden menacing cry that warned Nelson that the pursuers had, after going a longer way around, come once more in sight. Ah, Poseidon blast the traitorous Edmund and his varlets! See! panted Hero Giles, pointing to a huge arch from beneath which was issuing a glittering column of shouting, swift-running warriors at whose head dashed a splendidly proportioned figure that must be Hero Edmund. With the speed of the hunted, Hero Giles bounded forward, taking three and four steps at a stride, his jade-green cloak snapping out behind. 
down, ever downwards over the endless flight of stairs, the aviators followed him until, spent and panting, the hard-pressed five plunged down a final circular staircase and so gained a courtyard where waited a detachment of armored lancers whose yellow plumes and pennons shone bright in the glare of the flame suns. Staring anxiously upwards, the troopers nevertheless stood to attention in an orderly rank beside those curious Atlantean mounts called podokos. During all his sojourn in Atlans, Nelson had never become used to the hideous and awe-inspiring podokos, which closely resembled the allosauri but were only eighteen feet long. Like the other monsters, they had tremendously developed hind legs, which promised the speed now so vital for escape and safety. Ready in the tooth-studded jaws of each podoko was fitted a bronze bit, together with a bridle and reins, and cinched up on each creature's back was one of those curious Atlantean saddles which was built up at the cantle to overcome the downward slope of the podoko's spines. Need for vital haste was but too obvious, and as he drew near, Hero Giles gasped the command to be off. Quick, he shouted, his scarred visage flushed and sweat bathed. Saddles, speed, speed, killing fast as your beasts arise. All five literally hurled themselves into gorgeously caparisoned saddles. Instantly, the urging, squatting podokos leapt to their feet. It was the work of a moment for Nelson to wrench his reptile around, for already Alden and the Atlantean cavalrymen were speeding across the wide-paved court, their lance pennons fluttering bravely in the orange-hued glare. At top speed, the rescuers dashed for a great oval gateway, while the podokos increased their gait like aeroplanes gathering speed. The faster the weird creatures travel, the higher arose their tails. Then, following the frightened backward glances of the hard-riding red-haired lancers, Nelson suddenly discovered a new and terrible cause for this headlong flight, for, issuing from an unbarred gateway, came perhaps a dozen of the terrible and enormous allosauri, which, spying the fleeing cavalry, instantly gave chase. With a sense of despair, the aviators heard the ferocious bellows booming from behind and watched the appallingly swift progress of those uncouth monsters as, leaping high into the air, the allosauri covered between fifty and sixty feet at a single bound. "'They'll get you,' cried an inner voice in Nelson's being. "'They'll catch you, sure!' But the small and lithe podokos, sensing death leaping up from the rear, stretched out their slender, snake-like heads, stood on tiptoe, and, pressing their small forelegs tight against their chests, commenced to run far faster than any horse could gallop. Nevertheless, the allosauri came bounding up like colossal kangaroos, uttering weird, screaming roars that brought a chill of imminent death to the fugitives. Casting a quick glance over his shoulder, Nelson's blood froze to find an Allosaurus not more than seventy yards behind, and making terrible exertions to close that slender gap. Nearer and nearer coursed the incredible monster, body rocking in its terrific stride, dreadful jaws wide apart, jaws that could, without an effort, cut a horse in half. A fear such as he had never known racked Nelson's consciousness as he found he was hindermost of the cavalcade, which was strung out like a field of racers. The other riders crouched low in their saddles like jockeys, lances held straight out before them, and furiously goaded their strange mounts with curious hooks. Nelson was vastly relieved to get a glimpse of Alden far in the lead, almost beside the Atlantean prince. His podoko was evidently better than the average. Faster and faster, pursuers and pursued raced across level meadows, over straight white roads and rolling grain fields. Wind whistled madly in Nelson's ears, filled his eyes with tears, and made his short dark hair snap. But two huge allosauri, 
were now not twenty yards behind and gaining with appalling speed. On the verge of madness, Nelson hammered his heels into the Podoko's scaly side and wished he dared let go the saddle horn to draw his pistol, but to lose his grip was to risk falling off. Closer and closer, two enormous nightmarish heads were actually snapping at the fleeing Podoko's tail. Then fear must have inspired the reptile Nelson bestrode, for it put on a sudden desperate burst of speed which carried it past the next two lancers. In passing, he glimpsed the doomed wretches, pale-faced and horrified, as they frantically goaded their failing Podokos. A moment later, piercing screams from just behind assailed Nelson's ears. But when he looked to the rear once more, it was to find that a wide gap had opened between him and the great monsters behind. Evidently, the heavy-built allosauri were unable to long maintain the terrific pace set by the smaller and more agile podokos whose maximum speed Nelson judged to be well over sixty miles an hour. The pilot's eyes narrowed on beholding, in clear relief and not far away, the majestic whitish outline of mighty Heliopolis, whose lofty towers, graceful domes, and frowning citadels shone pink under the leaping, blinding glare on Mount Pelion. We certainly picked a nice time to drop in on this godforsaken country, grunted Alden, as the walls of Heliopolis loomed near. We seem to have crashed into the busiest days they've had in centuries. How many shots you got? Nelson, swaying to the steady trot of his podoko, hesitated. Only five. Damned if I know what's going to happen next. I suppose it all depends on Hero Giles. Looks as though the nobles were bent on restoring Altorius, if he's not dead by now. Alden tugged powerfully at the strange bridle which controlled his beast. The priests wouldn't dare kill him, but it surely looks like their rebellion has gained a lot of headway. A moment, Alden's clear blue eyes swept the towering battlements, gorgeously sculptured temples, and curious stepped pyramids, which now loomed near at hand and cast their rugged outlines sharp against the copper-colored heavens. Maybe there's some way we can work this revolution trouble to help us, suggested Nelson, without enthusiasm, if we could play off one crowd against the other. His remarks were cut short as the foremost lancers slowed before an enormous bronze gate looming ahead. On the vast main panel was a beautifully wrought dolphin curling about a trident, symbol of the imperial power, now so sorely tried. Beyond that gate, breathlessly mused Nelson, lay Heliopolis and an unknown fate. End of chapter 8 Recorded by Douglas W. Taylor Port Townsend, Washington.